Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. I really wanted to be here, and I'm so glad that I made it. Um, before I start, I just want to contextualize this talk. This talk is part is a chapter in a manuscript that I'm writing. Uh, the manuscript is about how to regulate cross-border surrogacy, and uh, it begins with with examining the moti motives for regulations. First of all, whether to to uh, allow or forbid surrogacy. So maybe there is something inherently wrong with the surrogacy. Uh, I say that there isn't. I'm not, I, I'm not convinced that there is something that is necessarily inherently wrong. And then I uh, go and look at what could be market failure. So maybe something in the way that the market uh, is uh, in the, in, in the way the, the, the market is uh, uh, conducted is wrong. And there, there are many uh, problems and failures that uh, can be perceived. So by this point, the, the reader already knows what are the motives for regulation. You will, you will not find it here. Then I go in and I check whether this should be the responsibility uh, of states alone or of the entire, you know, international community, and I find out that there are that, that there are no tools for for states themselves unilaterally to uh, address this thing. So the, the solution should be some sort of uh, international solution. And then I, I try to look at uh, possible forms of regulation, uh, human rights, which is probably the most discussed. And here I, uh, I try to look at uh, labor law. After I find both of these uh, unconvincing uh, as, a, as a soul, as a, the only way of regulation, I go and I, uh, and I suggest my own regulatory model that if you would like, I would, uh, I would uh, elaborate on later. So this is the chapter that examines whether labor law could be the answer to uh, regulate surrogacy. Um, and so and the, the aim of this, this paper is to see whether surrogates can be, uh, can qualify as workers, whether what they do can qualify as work, and whether la labor law can therefore be uh, the right protection. So I'm going to give you a trailer to my talk, okay? Let's see. This does not move. Here. Um, Can it be locked? No. A little bit of range. Just a second. Okay. Now, okay, just. So, these, um, um, a lot of uh, the quotes that I'm going to, to give here are taken from ethnographies. <laughs> uh, in my PhD dissertation, I was focusing on uh, ethnographies from India. The market in India has closed uh, uh, for foreigner uh, consumers or customers or patients or intended parents. And uh, now I'm looking at the markets in uh, the United States. I think that they're more interesting uh, because the disparity gaps are smaller. So the amount of exploitation is smaller, the gray area is much wider, right? Because it's not black and white, it's not obviously very exploitative, there might be a possibility that this could work, so I focus uh, on purpose on these uh, markets. And this is what one of the surrogates says. Because I don't have to do it, I want to do this. There are not many jobs out there where I think people would go through this much for a job. I mean, this is very emotionally taxing, physically and mentally, and I'm not doing it all, and I'm doing it all because I want to. I think it's a job in the aspect of how much time it takes, and you get compensated. You're doing a job, basically, and getting compensated. I don't feel like, like it's a job, no, because I could quit whenever I want to, and I don't know many people who would go through this much for a job. This is more personal, fulfilling things that I want to do for someone else. Confused? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think this, uh, 
quote kind of sums up so many complexities that we're going to see. And uh, now I'm going to do it a little bit more organized. <laughs> so um, there are many possible conceptualization of the market of uh, reproductive, uh, of comp compensated service. Some say that it's the sale of babies or renting an organ. Uh, they say that this is some sort of uh, care work or bodily, bodily labor. Um, but, the, but we don't really know how to conceptualize this thing. And I think that this is kind of necessary, whatever we want to do with it, however we want to regulate it. We need to understand uh, what, what are we really talking about. And in the past, work, work, any work that was done in the private sphere was considered not part of the labor market. Okay, so there was the productive sphere that was the labor market, and the, there was the reproductive sphere that was considered natural. And the natural uh, uh, um, pregnancy was a natural <coughs> thing. It was not supposed to be paid because it's not part of productive labor, like many other labors. Uh, Marx, for example, thought that this should not be part of the labor market. And of course, we all know that feminists got very angry with this thing and fought for years to have uh, the the, all the, the work that is done in the private sphere to have it recognized and paid and acknowledged, etc., etc. Was yes. Eng Engels disagreed with him on this, didn't he? I don't know. Not, I, I know that Engels was... was in line with many of the things that he said, but I'm not sure. I, I can check that out. Love um, your image choice. <laughs> well, I had to be at least, you know. <laughs> great. <laughs> so when we're talking about the division of labor between the private and the public sphere, we're usually talking about the discussion whether surrogacy should be paid or not paid. This is not what I'm doing. I'm not arguing that, that surrogacy should not be paid. I'm willing for it to be paid. I'm just saying that what we are paying for is not work, is something else. What are we paying for? Are we paying for children? Are we paying for... I, I'm not sure, and we can discuss that, but, but uh, I, the, the aim of this chapter is to show that... The, to call for different conceptualization rather than uh, work. So, I'm... In, my, in all my scholarship, I'm usually advocating or voicing surrogate women. So I'm going to do the same here, and I'm going to uh, show you what surrogacy is in the eyes of surrogates. And surrogates often refrain from calling it work. They emphasize other aspects, for example, the, the emotional part, the connection, so, and this is, this is a quote, all the yellow ones would be quote, quotes. Most surrogates, if you call it a job, they just get very, very angry, very upset. Or if you call them a professional surrogate, they say, no, this isn't a job. They don't want it to be considered, a, a, they don't want to be considered an, an employee. They want to be considered like a friend or like a partner. So. The, the contract of sur surrogacy will usually state formally that this, they are not employees, this is not a job. They often do not pay taxes like one would when they get salary. Um, and they try to avoid this, this conception. Why are they trying to avoid this con conception? First of all, they don't want to be treated like someone who's <coughs> after the money. Mm -hmm. They don't want to... They, they want to get away w from the concept of selling babies. Uh, they don't want to talk about exploitation. And they think that it would sound better and more palatable if they say that this is not a job. And the opposite is also true. So when they are talking about surrogacy as some sort of work, employment, job, it's always in a negative aspect. So it may, be, it, it, it may represent lack of respect on behalf of intended parents. It may re represent that something went wrong. Uh, and the idea is that employee is not in the same level of the employer, and therefore there is, they're kind of beneath the, the employer, and they want to avoid this concept. But they also say, 
I don't want to say I feel like a, an employee because I don't want I don't it, I don't look at it that way. I hate whenever you say or I read things where the parents are treating the surrogate like an employee. And that's just not a good relationship to have with each other. But it is a job. I have to commit to being at my doctor's appointment, taking medicine, taking my vitamins. So there's some sort of a conflict, inherent conflict in there. Usually what they say is that this is some kind of a gift. And the image of a gift is a, 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 is cross-cultural. Why? Because both in the US and in India, they're saying that it's a gift, but a different kind of gift. Of gift. So in the, uh, in the USA, she would say, it's not about the money. They couldn't pay me enough to have a baby for somebody else. At least not me. That's not, that's not how it works. Uh, it has to be a gift from, from the heart. It is meant out of love and out of kindness, not for the compensation you get. But it, in India, the gift would be for the woman, for the surrogate. I pray to Sai Baba. I have a lot of faith in him. I know this is his gift to a poor mother. I don't think I'll go for this again. I don't want to be greedy. So this is kind of the, the gift that the that God gives her because she's poor, so this is the gift that she's getting as an opportunity to get out of her financial kind of misery. So in the US, the gift is the baby? The gift is the ba like the kind thing that you're doing for someone else, and in, in, the, in India, this God, are give, God is giving you a gift that you can get money to get out of your misery. So the gift is the experience? Mm -hmm. more, the gift is the experience of the surrogacy versus mm -hmm. where in India. No, it's the money. No, no, it's no, the money. No, no, God is right. blessing you with an opportunity to get money, to mm -hmm. have money, to earn money. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's from the rest of the context that we know that here the poor mother is a surrogate and not the yes. intended mother. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, but it's also the gift that she can give this child. The child the because yeah, to be pregnant, for example. I mean, because I think that's very important to realize that all, I mean, that the whole idea is out of the, the, the knowledge or the idea that others don't have the gift to be pregnant. That's why they need a surrogate. Mm -hmm. So I think for her, it's also the gift not only to get the money, but it's also the fact that she can have a child and give it away. You know? Yeah, probably. Um, they have, so they have this all, whole thing of sisterhood, of uh, kinship in some sort of way in India. So once they do it, they have a sister, and of course they expect the sister to take care of them. But they don't think that the gift thing is all positive, because, be, because this conceptualization, uh, both in the US and in India, prevents them from negotiating for money. If they're giving a gift, then they lose their power the power that they have in the market to negotiate for money. This is why, personally, very unlike many femini feminists, I don't reject the concept of the market. I think that the concept of the market holds a lot of strength and power to women that they lose once we try to divert to other kind of a concept conceptualization. So, what do the ethnographs say? So the ethnographs are seeing all these women, they have some sort of variation, and they all think that this is a job, uh, but from very different reason. So um, some of them say that it's some sort of reproductive labor uh, or care, although if we looked at reproduc reproductive labor, at the, like at the classic definition, pregnancy and gestation would not be part of what we call reproductive labor, right? Some talk about the embodied labor, the fact that the site of the, of the work is women's body. This is where the, the work happens. Some will talk about the stigma, uh, and then they'll talk about dirty work, like we see in sex work and in other things. And some will talk about the emotional labor, and you cannot disagree with this. There's so many aspects of emotion here. Uh, there is uh, first of all, the relationship with the parents and the disconnection from the body and disconnection from the baby 
and all the hormonal emotions and all the disappointment if you try and you do not succeed to get pregnant and worry about the pregnancy there is no uh, there is no doubt about that but most of the of the ethnographs would call it like surrogates would and then they would use some sort of substitute definition such as a unique journey and uh, or a gift or all kind of things so now let us explore what is work about surrogacy. And I'm going to explore three options. Work is uh, uh, needed for, for income. So work is basically something that I have to do in order to, get an er to earn an income. Work as effort or hardship and work as a, a completion of a task. And I just want to say that um, there are some problems with work. Because, and I'm not a native uh, English speaker, as you can see, and work is usually a substitute for many other things that not even non uh, English native English speakers are struggling with. Work can be substitute for employment, for job, for profession, for, I don't know, for, men, for labor. Uh, but then not every sort of work is what reproductive labor is protecting. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, work as needed uh, for an income. So the, co the, the concept is that work is something that you uh, uh, do not want to do, but you have to do in order to earn an income. And we can see it in what the surrogates say, uh, but I don't feel like it's a job, and that's what he, my husband, told me. I don't want you to feel like this is another job that you have to do. But in India, of course, they'll say, it's, it's just something we have to do to survive. When we heard of surrogacy, we didn't have any clothes to wear after the rains, just one pair that used to get wet. And the roof of our house had collapsed. What were we to do? So if work is something that you have to do, it's not that surrogacy is necessarily work. It may be a work, work in India, but not work in the United States, right? Um, let, let's look at uh, work as force. Work as force is, so in physics, work is the force that you use, to, that you use in order to move something. Mm -hmm. This is probably the widest definition that we can have of work. <laughs> um, um, but in our work, we, only, we don't move anything except in inside, inside our brains. You see? So maybe it's not what the problem with it is <laughs> the problem with it is that you do not necessarily have to be an an agent, right? A human agent to do that, right? A machine can move things. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's very inclusive, which is a great benefit. We want as many people uh, recognize as uh, deserving some labor rights, but then I don't know if we want them not to be human agents. And then if we want to make it more human, we can talk instead of effort about hardship. So we know that in the Bible, uh, God told Adam, uh, by the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread, la la la. So you will have to work very hard uh, to earn your, uh, your bread. And again, we can see it in what the surrogates say. They say, you hate to call it a job, but it's part of uh, the job sometimes. You make those sacrifices. So I'm wondering if the fact that you bear something, bear some hardship, it makes it work. So when you are a statue, a statute uh, in, the, in the park, and you do not move, and it's very difficult, and you, you struggle a lot not to move, whether this is a job or not job. My problem with this would be, first of all, that as a legal definition, it's very subjective. So what is effort for one person is not an effort for another person. Um, and also, what will happen if technology would allow us to have an effortless pregnancy in the future? Would that mean that we would not be paying for work anymore, or we would not be paying them at all. Um, 
this is kind of difficult, although of course there is no doubt that with all the hormones that they have to take and the pregnancy that is very hard to bear, etc., etc., there is no, work, there, there is no uh, uh, doubt that there, there is a hardship in that. But also they al always try and emphasize and they say how, how much pleasure they get from being pregnant. Usually those who choose it would say, well, but I really enjoy being being pregnant. So if I enjoy pr being pregnant, does this mean that it, that it's not work? Would that just be work for those who suffer from the pregnancy? I'm not sure. I enjoy being a professor. So <laughs> exactly, and I'm, I'm not saying that work cannot be enjoyable. I, I'm you know, I'm thinking about singers and dancers, but yeah, <laughs> talking about being a professor, but okay. <laughs> But isn't, uh, isn't the Protestant ethic that we need to enjoy hard, the hardship of work specifically? Isn't it? And if going back to Weber and you know the, mm -hmm. the whole Protestant Puritan ethic is about enjoying the hardship. If there's no hardship, then that's not it's, it's not pleasing, you know. It's yeah. It it's, it doesn't give you enough satisfaction, right? It may be. It may be. I'm just saying that legally, it's kind of hard to work with. If I'm, I'm talking about labor law, I'm trying to. But but yes. But you're right. So, and then there is work as a, uh, as a completion of a task. So, the International uh, Labor Organization uh, uh, defines job, not work, but job, as a set of tasks and, tasks and duties designed to be performed by one person. So, it's basically, um, you have a task, you have to complete the task, uh, and, and this, is, this is job. This is a job. Uh, we can talk about Perform, performing the task of being pregnant with another person's child in exchange of money, right? This is a task. And you can see that they're talking about this. this. You, they're saying, you just have to think, this is my job, I have to make sure I take my meds, I have to make sure I stay healthy and eat right, and be more careful in the pregnancy than I have before. So you just have to have the mindset and the focus and follow direction, like this is my job and I take it seriously, okay? So, um, this, is, this is another option, but there is a problem with that. Because what happens with all the surrogates that are trying and that are miscarrying, for, some, for example? Does that mean that they didn't do their job? They didn't do their job well? Maybe they're, they shouldn't get paid? Maybe they should even feel guilty for not doing their job well? There is a lot of, uh, I understand that they're trying to um, avoid um, selling the, the, the money thing, so they're talking about the task rather than the money, but then they're, they're trying to avoid the concept of selling children, but then if, it's, if we're talking about the task, if you don't have a child, then you did not complete your task, then until you have a child and are practically getting exchange, getting giving the child in, in exchange of money. You did not complete your task. So and even if you didn't get pregnant, but you got shots and exactly. you underwent yeah. something, yeah. maybe think, that's the task to try to get pregnant. But it's also maybe. the same. Like for example, a researcher will be paid for trying to get something, but the task will be in the process and not in the result. So. So the question is, the what is the yeah. task here? What is the obligation of means or results? Mm -hmm. But then, do you? So again, I'm just finding it hard to. I doubt if I present to intended parents, "Hello, you're pre you're paying her to try to get pregnant," and then she completed this task. She tried, but there's there is yeah, no, no child. No. So what are we doing in terms of the exchange? Like, how would <coughs> such a market <coughs> function? economically or I don't know. Even from the legal point of view, what exactly. is the obligation of the contract? So exactly. Yeah. So and then so and then after saying all this, we know that the world of work has changed, right? So basically everything that I said so far is unnecessary, right? Work can be in the public sphere and can be in the in the private sphere. You can have skills for some works you do not need skills. Um, you, it can uh, involve hardship, it can be a lot of fun, um, you, ca you can enter work because you need money or because you do not need, or even if you do not need money. We also know that there is, 
there, there are works that are not paid, right? There's voluntary work, there are all kind of uh, other works. And so I don't know what surrogacy has to comply with in order to be con conceptualized as work. Um, so just to summarize this part, um, why isn't it work? So first of all, we have this confusion between work and labor and profession and all of these. And then work has changed a lot, so we can't really grasp what it is. Um, and many of the definitions that I talked about are subjective, which is, which are, which is really hard to work with. Okay? So now I will tell you that in law, it doesn't matter what work is. In law, they're not, work, they're not looking at what, what work is. They're looking at working relationships. So let's, let's try to explore a little bit whether there is a relationship of worker and employee and employer between the surrogates and, and someone. So before I go there, I just want to say that if a worker is an, uh, 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 is an employee or a worker, uh, if a surrogate is a worker, then there are many advantages in labor law. Labor law has many aspects. It can obligate us to, uh, to protect safety uh, in the workplace, to prevent uh, exploitation and have fairness in the working relationships, to give labor rights to the, to the worker, and basically I think that being a worker contributes to one's uh, empowerment and recognition. And the fact is that it's really does, it really doesn't matter what you do. So in Israel, there was a case of a sex worker who went to the labor court and she asked for her, asked for her rights. And the labor, law, the labor court, of course, didn't dare to discuss the question whether sex work is work or not. But he says it doesn't matter. She's a worker. It doesn't matter what the work is. She's a worker. Thus, she's protected. Therefore, uh, she can have the rights. So maybe we can say the same about surrogates. And I'm going to uh, look at the purpose of a uh, labor law, and I'm, this is according to the international labor law. Now, domestic labor law is much more um, elaborated. Uh, uh, the resolution is much higher. Uh, but the thing is that if you only focus on domestic uh, labor law, People who do not like whatever regulation that we have in the domestic sphere, for example, you say in the domestic sphere you can get a commercial surrogacy until the age of 45. You turn 50, you want to have a child, you just go to another place and have a child. This is why I need some sort of international, uh, international regulation. So I'm looking at international labor law. And there basically five or four, it depends how you divide them, four rights in the international um, labor law. And there, the elimination of all uh, forms of forced or com compulsory labor, uh, abolition of child labor, it's irrelevant here, um, uh, freedom of association uh, that is supposed to bring to more uh, balanced uh, collective bargaining, and elimination of uh, discrimination. So let us look first at forced labor, because this is probably the most important one. So we're looking at relationship, and basically every, every work relationship uh, transfers some, uh, some control to the employer. Okay, If I have an employer, he I owe my time to him, I may owe some actions to him or some, uh, some products to him. Um, he can tell me where to be, he can tell me that he lets me, for example, work from home, but I owe him something. He has control over uh, many aspects of my life. And this, this relationship is not balanced. So he has always more power than me. The, the employer will always, always have more power. And therefore, it is very, very important that working relationship would be based on autonomous decision, free decision to enter these kind of, um, of relationship, relationships. And um, 
there were a lot of uh, there was uh, there were there were talks about whether surrogacy is not some kind of voluntary slavery. Slavery when you enter, and then you are in complete control of of the uh, of the clinic of the medical clinic, for example, and you cannot do much. Uh, the, your decision over your bodies are not entirely yours. They some of it belongs to the to the intended parents, and maybe this is some sort of uh, slavery. So I don't think that it is slavery. I think that is, this is kind of um, a, a limited amount of time. Uh, I compare it to uh, signing, to volunteering to be in the Big Brother show. Do you have the Big Brother show? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, you are stuck there. The complete con they control your time. They control your kind of behavior, right? You are very, very limited. Um, they control your privacy. But this is only for I don't know how many months, and this is it. So here again, it's only for so so many months, and not and you know after that you regain all your autonomy, and um, and that's it. And so in a way, I think that also what what we saw just a second. In a way, I think that also what we saw before with surrogates trying to say that they don't have to do this. Uh, this is what it means, right? I chose to do this. I do not need to do this. I chose to do this. This is what this was my autonomous decision. Yes. I could leave it till you. Yeah, that you can also say no. I just wanted to yeah. say that. Well, is, why is why is slavery have to be permanent? Isn't most like indentured slavery? The examples are you can you stop being a slave once you paid your debt or whatever. So it depends on uh, on what you think that the problem is in slavery. And I'm, I think that I meant it because I was looking at the approach that says that the problem with slavery is that you cannot regain your autonomy. There, there, there are many wrongs in slavery. It just has to do with why you think that slavery is wrong. And mine was that you lose the autonomy, autonomy to, regain your, to regain your autonomy. For some okay. time or forever? Well, I think that being a slave is you lose it forever. That we can legally yeah. or morally or, uh, or conceptually, I think it depends on what what you what you see as slavery. Mm. If you're a slave, then you do you do not have autonomy. You're property. You're not you're not an autonomous agent. Agent, mm. or else you are. You can be forced labor, or you can, you know there are many other concepts. But but this is you know you can choose another form of of slavery. It just has to do. One, yeah, and maybe I need to explain that, but I did, this is what I saw as the problem. So we see that they, they do insist that they have uh, agency to enter the, um, to enter the relationship and the relationship. And once they're in the relationship, there is ex an extreme amount of control, right? So they have to do all these um, exams, they have to take a um, that they have to take certain medicines or vitamins or shots, and and they're, they're, they have to avoid drinking and smoking and uh, and maybe if there is uh, there are deficiencies in the fetus, someone would decide whether they are, they will abort or not. There are many many aspects of control, and the the big question is what would be considered a legitimate <coughs> amount of control in this context. So some of the control is necessary for the safety of the woman and for the safety of the fetus. Necessary. Cannot be negotiated. Other uh, parts of the uh, control are negotiable, right? And so we know that in the US, women live in their house with their families. They, if they have a, a, another job, they can go to the other job, keep on their life inside in their communities. Uh, but then in India, they are living in, it really matters what I say now, but in I, either hostels or farms or camps, they're called different names, where, where all the surrogates are living, they're under, under 24 hours of uh, control of the clinic that may tell them what to eat. Sometimes they will uh, let them eat Western food, so they won't, it won't be the food that they're used to, or uh, sometimes they would not allow them to get off bed, and 
the amount of control is uh, much uh, much higher. So, and and we see that even in the U.S., surrogates are they have very different opinions. So one surrogate could say that the decision over her body are not hers, they're of the intended parents because it's their baby, and another one would say, no, I'm sorry, we have to negotiate these things. But the amount of control is very, very uh, high anyways. It, inherently, it is, it is very high. But you know what? There are many, many kinds of jobs where we have a very high amount of control. Mm -hmm. Amount of, con of control can be high when it, it is required for uh, the worker's safety, or when there is teamwork, or when you have to produce something in a certain way, so it will be um, uh, in, a, in the same way all around the world, or we have athletes that they, you know, we have, we have control over the body, they're checked for narcotics and all kinds of things. So we know that these things exist. And Martha Nussbaum, she says that this element is really about human work. And this is the, de her, the definitions that she gives for human work, having some choices about the work to be performed, some reasonable measures of control over it, its conditions and outcomes, and also the chance to use thought and skill rather than just function as a cog in a machine. But she says, you know what, this, all this thing, human work, this is a luxury. Of course, later, in a, in a later writing, she says that a political, a social, political, familiar, familial and economic conditions that prevent a, people from choosing to function in according to their capabilities violate dignity. So later on, she can say something that can be interpreted as contradicting this. Yes. So for years I've been teaching about surrogacy, and every time I discuss the living conditions of surrogates in India, it leads me to the argument that you can't even use the same conceptual framework for that and what is going on in, in the rich US. countries. So the, the discussion of whether it's work or labor, that we should have two separate discussions. Because yes, maybe the process of getting pregnant Carrying a pregnancy, giving birth is the same, but that's all that's the same. Everything else that matters ethically is different. And I, I think the level of control that they're experiencing living in those clinics, detached from their own children, uh, not able to leave, an athlete can walk away. They really mm -hmm. cannot walk away. Yeah. Um, to, that makes it so profoundly different that I wonder about your enterprise of discussing both context under the same big conceptual umbrella. So I kind of need to do that because I don't think that the, the regulation could be fragmented in this aspect mm -hmm. just because it's cross-border. I don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and we saw that the market is extremely flexible. So they closed India, India so they took the Indian surrogates to Nepal and then they closed Nepal and then they took them to Thailand and then I heard Vietnam and now Mexico and Georgia and it's just moving, it, you know, until everybody will close their gates, they're still, they're still moving. But I do completely agree that, and I, I, didn't, um, I didn't frame it as in labor law, but exploitation is contextual. So the same offer, the same suggestion in one country would be exploitative, and in and in another country would not be exploitative. Definitely. Is that how you deal with the difference? Yeah, it, through exploitation, because because for me, again, it, it just like before with the slavery. It depends on what how you define exploitation, and strangely enough, just like there is no definition of work, there is no definition of exploitation. They think that everybody knows what we're talking about, although we're thinking about completely different. We may think of completely different things. But for me, exploitation has to do, it, it is autonomous. I think that exploitation is autonomous and even rational, but it, it means that you autonomously choose something out of your vulnerability. And if you're not as vulnerable as the other guy, then it does not measure to be ex exploitation. So, um, yes. Um, okay, so, we are here, and then you just brought me to the to the last thing. Oh, okay, and another thing. So, uh, when when you're doing something that you hate to do, and imagine that this is your job, 
you can doze off, right? You can you put your hat your headphones or you go at five o'clock home and forget about it and have fun or I don't know or get drunk or whatever you do. Um, or go to a vacation, you keep your private life and your work life very separate. Of course, surrogates cannot do that. But this is from a, an ethnography in Israel, and what they say is that they get, they separate different body parts. Mm -hmm. So they say, my, my, my belly is not me, this is still me, this may still be me, but my belly is not me, I'm, I'm not my belly at this point, okay? so. They do try to disconnect. It is impossible because they take their body anywhere with them. But, but then they do try to disconnect in some other uh, way. So we can also see, if we take it one step uh, ahead, we can also see that if we're talking about uh, working hours, which is labor legislation, very basic labor legislation, we cannot, we cannot give her vacation time or working hours, you, you know, limit her working hours, we, we simply cannot do that. And then it leads me, Valdit, exactly to what you talked about, which is the exit point. Mm -hmm. So any labor law, spe specifically uh, specific labor laws, cannot be enforced. So again, I'll take the singer, uh, <laughs> the singer example, I'm a great singer and someone contracted me and I don't want to do this. They cannot force me. Nobody can force me. I may have to pay damages or contract bridge, but they cannot force me to go there and sing, right? Um, sur surrogate, a surrogate cannot really go out of the, of the contract or exit the contract, not without a very, very high price. First of all, f both physically and emotionally, abortion is not easy. Not all, of, not all women would agree to do that. Not all countries' legislation would allow to do that. Not in any time of the, pro, of the, of the pregnancy. They are really stuck there. And they cannot enter, and they cannot uh, exit the, the contract. And moreover, of course, she, she will probably have to compensate the parents for breaching the contract. And if the reason that she entered this contract is because she needs money, so the, there are really no realistic options for her to, uh, to get out of it. Do you consider keeping the baby as an exit point? No. Why not? Because I think that... It was my same thought. <laughs> because I think... Because I think that... Probably this is not the reason she entered this. She did not mean to have a child through this contract. Mm. Her, you know, to raise a child. Mm. And again, and it, it depends. It depends whether she has money or not. Whether she can, mm. you know. In Israel, we we are very strong. We very strongly opposed to the fact that they mm. took out uh, the socioeconomic clause from the from the reasons you can abort, mm. and then. You know, she's even if she's not weak, she does not necessarily have the means to raise another child. This is this is not a, a deal that is as if nothing happened. I mean, it it, it is a, a price. But a lot of women get pregnant without having planned that, for example. Still nowadays. I know, but she planned not to have the child, not to keep the child. She, yeah, you she never know. I mean, specifically planned differently, right? But you can look mm -hmm. inside people's psyche, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, also issues, I mean, psychoanalytically you can raise the question, why do women do this, and what is it all about this emotional work about, for example, where does it come from? So I can talk about it later, because yeah, I, yeah. uh, okay. uh, I do so have an idea about that, that. Okay, but great. what I'm saying is, so in the same way you can say that abortion that, that she can abort, and it would be. I, what I'm saying is just that the exit mm -hmm. is not without a price. It no, will no, always have sure. a price. Yeah, you don't have to argue that there is no exit. Mm -hmm. You can say the exits that exist are much more difficult than in any other context of labor. Yeah, they, so that's they not have a very argument. high price, mm -hmm. both physically and emotionally, and on in the aspect of changing your life or. <clears throat> You know, or scarring your soul, or whatever, you know, whatever the price. Okay. <laughs> so, 
that was about forced labor, right? Uh, where again, I'm reminding the context, international law gives us four principles to follow, that was forced labor. Now let's talk about freedom of association. The idea behind freedom of association is that collective bargaining, that there, there is never balance between employers and, empl and employees, and that collective uh, balance would allow all the workers uh, an opportunity to um, improve their living and working conditions, the, one th the ones that we talked about before, uh, and indeed, at least in the United States and even in India, surrogates have ways to communicate with each other. So a lot of the ethnography, one of the ethnographies was done, was done on uh, blogs in the internet where they get, uh, where they get support and they, get inf they exchange information, etc., etc. But then there are some problems with this thing. First of all, what is the real power of the group? What, the, what can they achieve? As I said before, many of the inherent conditions of surrogacy are non-negotiable. They cannot negotiate, negotiate how much control doctors will have on their body because this is needed for safety reasons, for the welfare of the mother and the, and the, and the fetus. Who is the employee? Who are they, they negotiating with? So eth ethnographers, some say that, it's the, that they, it's the intended parents, some they say that they have two em employers, mm -hmm. the intended parents and the clinics. Surrogates would say that they work for the clinics and that their relationship with the intended parents is different. So if it's the intended parents, then there are many different employers. They cannot negotiate the same employer, right? If it's the clinic, they may, have, they may be able to uh, uh, negotiate with the clinic, but it, the clinic is in charge exactly about those conditions that are non-negotiable. -negoti and many other con conditions are personal. So for example, uh, it will be much more efficient, in, efficient instead of negotiating to match a, a surrogate that believes in abortion of uh, fetuses with deficiencies with parents who believe in that, right? But this is very personal. Also, my relationship with the, with the parents may, may uh, change my attitude regarding what I'm allowing them to do. Mm -hmm. So many of the surrogates in these ethnographies were, were more than one time surrogates, right? Mm -hmm. And it may be very different from the, for them uh, between one, one uh, couple of intended parents and another. And uh, maybe some, one surrogate will have no problem with, uh, with males entering with her to her gynecologist uh, exam and another will. Mm -hmm. So it, these are not really th things that we can negotiate collectively. So, and then, and then at the end of this thing, we also can, uh, uh, can talk about the way of enforcement. So the way to enforce uh, collective uh, bargaining is to send a, what they called is supervisors or uh, I don't I don't remember the the legal fr the legal term, but they they someone goes there and, and monitors and it see mm -hmm. it sees that the the whatever conditions they have that they're fulfilled. So what does it mean that they will send someone to the to the gynecologist? Uh, uh, this is kind of problematic. So this is also not very practical. And then the right not to be discriminated. So what does the right not to be discriminate, discriminated imply here? Does it imply that any, that if the intended parents, for example, are the, uh, are the, the employer, that they have to accept any woman who is fulfilling certain conditions? What would be those conditions? What would be a legitimate uh, way of scrutinizing the the, um, the surrogate? Or if the surrogate is self-employed, does she have to accept any intended parents that uh, that come to her? Mm -hmm. This is this looks very very problematic for. A application. And so what are the skills that we can think of? So um, circuits talk about the fact that they're a source of knowledge. So they know the legal and the medical field, they know how to uh, pass through the exams more efficiently, 
uh, they know how to handle their emotions and their relationships involved in surrogacy and how to uh, advocate themselves uh, uh, and their intended, intended parents. A lot of the things that they said that they have to uh, face people who are criticizing them and what they have to do is they have to push back on this criticism and this is a lot of the job, uh, of the work that they have to do. Okay, but then they also say that the skills that a surrogate should have is that, is that she should be smart, responsible, reliable, helpful, uh, compassionate, altruistic, willing to sacrifice, loving, and yet emotionally independent. I don't know how, again, how you scrutinize this, but I also think, and they also, <laughs> and, and they also think that each pregnancy is different. I can be very patient with some people, with most people I'm not. So I don't know how it would be after nine months in relationship with these intended parents that may also change their behavior uh, to me. So, and some of them say that they're, um, um, that she should treasure the experience, again, estimate the pain. How can you estimate, you do not know how much pain you're going to be. And the fact is that, that this pregnancy may be completely different than your other pregnancy. So, you know. Um, going back to the discrimination slide, mm -hmm. I just wanted to tell you uh, that in Canada, because we're not allowed to compensate, and the whole enterprise is seen legally and ethically as altruistic, uh, usually what happens is that if a woman comes forward and says, I want to be a surrogate, she will be presented by dossiers of candidate parents, and she selects who she, she selects. wants to help. So she's the one discriminating. Because exactly. she can say, I don't want to work with a gay couple, I only want to work with certain religion, but she has all the power to choose who to help. So one of the skills so that just sex workers, workers do, do is over. they say mm -hmm. that, sex workers say that they have the skill of knowing how to choose their clients. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of similar in a way. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it in a bad, in a bad way. Mm -hmm. I'm, Whatever gives her power, I would probably be for it. But then if she is self-employed, then what you are saying is illegal. If she's self-employed, it's like what happens with the people selling ca uh, wedding cakes and not willing to sell wedding cakes mm -hmm. to, to gay couples, mm -hmm. right? So it all depends on how we conceptualize it again, yeah. right? This is the importance of con conceptualization. And finally, we are in the social considerations. So what if surrogacy was work? I hope that by now I showed that it would be practically very, very difficult to enforce or even to regulate. Um, there is also the thing about normalization. This is again uh, an argument that usually rise with regards to sex work. Once surrogacy is regulated, so my nightmare is that once surrogacy is regulator, regulated, a woman would go to the unemployment office to get unemployment uh, fees. Mm. And I don't know how it is here, but in, in Israel and in many other places, I know that even in Europe, even in Scandinavia, which is extremely socialist and stuff, uh, they come and they say, well, you will get unemployment fees only if we can't get you another job. Mm -hmm. And once it is, it is a job, she, they would look at you and say, oh, you have kids? Then we have just the job for you. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you, well, you will not get unemployment fees until you, you try this job, because we have many parents waiting. So um, this is kind of a problem. This is part of the problem of uh, legitim legitim legitimization of this uh, whole process. And I just want to say that when I went to the unemployment job, they looked for me they couldn't find me a, another job because it wasn't even enough that they looked for only for, uh, I'm a lawyer, so they looked for me for law. They, they didn't find health law. So they couldn't find me a job and I was entitled to unemployment. Who will be the women who will be left out with these options? It will be only the, the, the lower socioeconomic um, class that can do, does not have any other qualification to, to get this thing. So, um, okay, uh, and, and, okay, and another thing, I kind of uh, did the comparison between uh, sex, job, sex work quite uh, a lot, and I want to say that a lot of the pushback 
to call a surrogacy a, jo a job or work comes from uh, scholars who deal with trafficking and with mm -hmm. prostitution. And I want to say that this is completely different. This, is really ma this really makes me angry, and this is very, very diff different. So in sex work, we talk a lot about abolishment, right? About criminalization. This is not the situation that we have here. In sex work, the alternative to her being a worker is her being a victim, right? And of course, that if, if the choice is, if is between a victim and a worker, it's much more empowering to be a worker. I don't think that the alternative for surrogates surrogates is to be a victim. I don't think that anybody sees them as victims. They, they might be a, more vulnerable than others, but they're not victims. And I personally am not calling for abolishment of the market. So for me, they're business women, and the, the market gives them a lot of powers and a lot, and, and a lot of force that they can use, because although they're, they're so socioeconomically more vulnerable, they're, they're the one with the product that everybody wants, and there are much more people who want it than people who are willing to give it. So, in a way, I'm really trying to give them the power back. And then there's the acknowledgement. So, this is probably my, my most radical argument. While I stand 100% behind it, I'm very scared to say it, but I will. <laughs> I think that eventually there is a lot about being and not doing in pregnancy. The fact is that even women that are in coma can produce this child that they want so much. And sometimes they have clauses in the, in the, um, in the contract that would say that, that if you, if you need to be disconnected from a respirator and you're pregnant, they will not disconnect you until you finish the job, right? The task. And so I don't, I don't see how this is how saying this is empowering for women. It's not that I think that it's not shouldn't be valued. It's just that saying that when women do this, they're doing, they're they're, this is work in the sense of labor law. Not that it's not hard work. I go to the gym. It's Horrible. It's mentally <laughs> exhausting. I need to prepare myself. It's physically exhausting. I, I'm very tired after it, but it's not work in this sense. Okay? So saying that women do work in this, I don't find it and this is the, the I don't find it very I don't find it very empowering. Um, the only thing the only other analogy that I can find to this is uh, being subject to clinical trial. When you submit your body and you don't, the, the job is to, not, the, to have someone wait to see how your body reacts. But even in clinical, in, in clinical trials, the, someone is looking, you have, it has to be on, uh, you, ha, you, you most likely will benefit from it. You can quit whenever you want. It's still, better as far as I can see than this situation. So I don't like it to be <laughs> called a job. So so I miss I you, this is important and I don't understand. You don't want to call it work mm -hmm. because this is something that happens to the woman rather than that's than some something she does. It's not that or it's it happens being more to her doing it's being more like she doesn't her agency does not control it. If she drinks and she smokes, which is something that she must not do as part of her job, a baby will, will suffer. No, a baby will still develop, right? Yeah. It will, you know what, there was, there was an article in Israel when they, talk, when they talked in, in the Friday night news magazine, and they, they talked to women and they were all, most of them were single, uh, divorced single mothers. Um, and they said, yeah, and I told them that I wasn't smoking, but you know, they were not there all the, the whole time. So they smoked, 
and they still deliver their baby, the, the baby, and the, the you know the transaction was completed and the task was completed and you know this is this is not something that you choose to stop doing, and I think that work is something more than that. I'm not saying that it's not valuable. You know what? In a way, if you wanted me to be to take it to the next level, I'm, I say that it, it would even be better, although I'm not sure that this is the best, but it would even be better to say, you know what? Selling babies is not that bad. Here, baby, it's a precious product. We did this, and we're, we're paying you for this. But like to say, it's kind of to say to a surrogate, yeah, you just be pregnant. This is your job. I have a problem with that. Let's continue this discussion, perhaps. You, you give me yeah, the last slide. Yeah, that's the last slide. So, continue. just to, to conclude, um, surrogates want to be acknowledged, but they wa don't want whatever they want, they, they're doing to be acknowledged as work. I think that labor law misses many aspects of surrogacy that it cannot handle. I'm not saying that they should not be paid, rather than rather that their the conceptualization should be different, um, or that they're not worthy of respect or recognition, and just that there are many other options for regulations that I think that are more compatible with, with whatever this is. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. <laughs> I, I feel free to chair this discussion, which I guess will be very uh, engaging. I just want to say it was such a pleasure to listen to your presentation. You. I'm looking forward to the discussion. So the floor is open for questions. Just, yes, just very quickly. So this is based on you writing this argument. And is it going to come out? Or? This is a chapter in a hopefully upcoming book. <laughs> Yes, please. Okay, I'm not sure my question will be uh, very clear, but you say that it being uh, a surrogate mother would be more about being pregnant than doing something. And how I find it difficult to see that it's uh, not um, problematic that with a market to be uh, the fact that you're being something and that while you're being something, you want to ha add market to it, I think it can be easily problematic. So the difference would be, if I would, um, if I would run a class now, and I would tell you that surrogacy contracts are contracts in the market, I would ask you, what are the contracts? What are we contracting? What, what, we have a contract. What is the meaning of this contract? Is it the contracts about selling? Uh, babies, is it a contract about renting organs, is it the contract about willing to to go through fertility treatments, what is the contract? What would you tell me? There are many, there are many answers, right? Yeah. There are many. The same goes if I ask you what is the work? Mm -hmm. What is the work that we're doing? So I'm, what I'm saying is that the contract does not necessarily have to be about being. The contract can be conceptualized as many many different things, right? Mm -hmm. It is not so, but the work eventually would be about you know you can say that you are doing. I go to yoga. I rub almond oil. It's nice. Nobody would pay you to go to yoga, or not necessarily. This is not what you're paid for, right? To go to yoga. Yeah, but my my question is not about that because I'm, I I agree with you. It's a for me, it's more about being than doing something, and for me, it's not work. So I'm really okay with all you said earlier, but for me, that means it's difficult to not be in exploitation mm -hmm. when there is money in it, because all your body, all your, even though they say that that's not them, that's them because it's attached to them, you know. So for me, that's a very difficult, um, it's difficult for me in English. So. No, no, I, I completely understand. Yeah. So probably the answer to what you're saying is that we, that is a, the question whether we can decide for them once they autonomously decided to 
submit their body mm -hmm. for the market. It's like they're autonomous to not be autonomous. It's like they have the agency to not have agency for nine months. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's it's a paradoxal. Yes. Yeah, there is a paradox. It's there. called the happy slave paradox. Okay. Mm -hmm. But here it's limited in time. If somebody says, I'm happily and autonomously becoming the slave of this yeah. person because he's going to be the best owner of us mm -hmm. and I'm going to have a good life uh, under his ownership. But it's still considered today okay. an unethical choice for everybody. But it's limited in time, as you highlighted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it's the... Okay. Okay, there was, you had a question, mm -hmm. uh, Well, I was wondering, I would like to get to hear a few examples of what those alternative types of legislations would be. I'm so happy that you asked. <laughs> <laughs> so, my proposed um, regulation is something that I came up with. So, it does not exist today. It requires different understanding of the international law called the shared respons responsibility model. It is based on evidence and it is based on something that is called associative duties. It, uh, so the idea is that there are kind of circles of connections and these circles of connections like tiers of responsibility. These circles of connections are between everybody that, that is engaged in a certain practice. So for example here we will have the doctors, the intended parents, the surrogates, the mediators, the brokers, uh, states, maybe NGOs, maybe the WHO, international organizations. Mm -hmm. And each kind of relationship would require different responsibilities. Those who are, who are more closely engaged would have certain responsibilities that would be very different in, in um, it, it, both in, in, the, in the nature of responsibility and in the amount of responsibility than others. Those who would have more capacity to prevent harms, for example, would have probably more responsibility. Some responsibilities are institutional because the, the engaged parties are institutions. Some are personal. Um, and, um, and it's re responsibility not in the, same, in the sense of guilt, like it is in criminal law, like you're responsible, so you're guilty. No, it's responsibility to make things um, better, in a way, uh, to correct the situation. I just... If, yes. if you want the two-page version of this, this is a paper that Sharon wrote where she's applying the model in another context. I'll, circle, I'll pass it around, you can write the reference down. And just another example, so... In, I just thought today, because I'm very, I'm quite conservative in many, in many aspects. But then everybody sees me as very liberal, and I, just today on the plane, I thought, why does everybody see me as such a liberal? And, and I, but I am very liberal because my point of view to public policy is the fact that we have to kind of bear everybody's opinions, and it, and they, are, they should, most of them should be legitimate. So, I, in this sense, I'm very liberal. But I think that for me. Autonomy should should include a price for, or responsibility for for the consequences. So if I tell you you are completely you are completely autonomous, but you have a response, your autonomy is subjected to your responsibility to ethics, then it makes your auton uh, the, your autonomy much. Uh, much more limited, right? Because you cannot do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want that is still responsible, right? So, in a way, this is the, the idea. And so, just to, uh, to explain, for example, one of these aspects of shared, shared responsibility. So, part of the responsibility is the responsibility of intended parents. And for them, for example, I'm, I'm uh, arguing for fair trade regu regulative model. So just like we buy fair trade coffee because we are ethical, and this is our responsibilities as people who are buying coffee and we have some responsibility to the coffee picker in the third world country, uh, I think that, that there is a responsibility of the, of the intended parents 
to, to make sure that whatever transactions they're doing in the market should be subjected to fair trade and fair, mm. fair tr terms, etc., etc. Et mm. So this is, this is, you know, in a nutshell. 